Millions of James Bond fans around the world line up to see Moonraker. The question for legendary Bond producer Cubby Broccoli is, where does James Bond go from here? The answer proves to be simple. 007 needs to come back to Earth. To help shape Bond's entrance into the 1980s, producer Cubby Broccoli relies on the rising star of the James Bond creative team, his stepson, Michael Wilson. With Moonraker, we went really, I think, pretty far along the track of touching on science fiction. It was a tremendously successful film. It was one of the most successful in the series. But I had a feeling that, that if we tried to go down that road, we would just become more and more outlandish until we got really silly. Fear Eyes Only was an attempt to sort of retreat from that, those excesses. To help make this transition, Broccoli promotes a hard-edged action unit director from three previous Bond films, John Glenn. When I got awarded the Fear Eyes Only to direct, uh, we had long talks about how we were going to uh, get the character back get his feet literally back on the ground again. To get the story right, Broccoli and Wilson turned to veteran screenwriter Richard Maybaum. Well, I'd known Dick Maybaum since, you know, I was a teenager, and uh, he'd written so many of the great Bond films. I started working with Dick, uh, just, I was at that time the executive producer on the films. And uh, as we got working more and more, he asked me to take a stab at writing a few things, and then he suggested we become collaborators. For inspiration, Wilson and Maybaum returned to the works of 007's creator, Ian Fleming. Starting with two James Bond short stories, For Your Eyes Only and Risico, the writers develop a plot straight from Fleming's pen. Wilson and Maybaum even include a key sequence from the novel Live and Let Die. The working relationship proves fruitful. The writing team of Richard Maybaum and Michael Wilson shape a new vision of Bond for the 1980s. As it happened, I was very pleased that Roger did it because it helped me enormously in the fact that he was an established James Bond. If I had to take someone new and, and uh, establish them in the role, it, it would have been quite difficult for me, I think. Director Glenn brings in some new faces behind the cameras. My background is documentaries. I started off in documentaries. and. Um, I, uh, I, I used to direct hand photograph when I was doing that, and that's how John knew me. If you met Arthur, you, you wouldn't think he'd be a, an ace cameraman like that because he wears thick glasses, and he tripped over the carpet when he first met Cubby Broccoli as he walked in the office, which wasn't a good start. It was a great excitement because it was a, um, Bonds. Bond, Bonds have always been a, a type of film that I've always wanted to do. With acclaimed production designer Ken Adam unavailable, filmmakers turn to a familiar face. Peter Lamont, a 007 veteran since Goldfinger, worked his way up through the art department on nine previous Bond films. I was called by Eon and they said, uh, you know, who would you like to work for next? Ken's gone off to America with her Ross to do Pennies from Heaven. And I kind of said, well, why not me? And uh, an hour or two later, I was the production designer. Lamont's detailed and realistic designs reflect a new direction for the series. We all sat down and Cappy said, we better tell you this right away, we're not going to spend that tough of money on the next Bond. I want Bond doing the detecting and I don't want him to be overtaken by a lot of gadgets. With the key team in place, filmmakers turned to casting. We had Roger and we were now looking for um, a leading lady. Carol Bouquet was a French actress that I recommended to Cubby Brackley to consider for the part. She'd done some French films. She had the most gorgeous hair. And I immediately could see the, the crossbow sequence, you know, the only Fleming element. And there she was, Melina, I could see her. She has these extraordinary color eyes. Most attractive, most lovely girl. One of the loveliest people to ever play a Bond lead, the fact that she became the face of Chanel, she should prove that. The heavy in the Bond is, of course, always of paramount importance to get the right heavy. And uh, on this occasion, we chose um, Julian Glover. And Julian, I'd had the pleasure of working a couple of times on, on the scene, so it was nice being back with him. 
again, good villain, good part. Julian is a very sinister sort of character on the screen. A very good looking man, in fact. There was some talk about him being a James Bond at one time. He was just too young at the time to play Bond. And then when we got around to using him, he was a little too old. <laughs> so he, he played one of the heavies later on. He was a very good actor. Filmmakers find the other leading actor of the movie with a bit of serendipity at a party in London. Dana Broccoli came across to me and said, Topol, what a good idea. Cobby, what do you think of Topol playing Colombo? And this is how I was, how I was cast. Once in a while, they listen to me. <laughs> Topol, boy, he could rival Roger Moore in the charisma department. Topol's sort of famous for playing fiddler on the roof. I don't think he can live it down. It's rather like being an ex-James Bond. You can never shake it off quite. With casting complete, filmmakers begin layering the script with links to James Bond's past, including Bond's brief marriage. You know, it was John Glenn who came up with the idea of going to Tracy's grave, I think he wanted to show a, a continuity of the Bond stories and show that he's still the same character, he's still going on, he has a history. Shooting begins on September the 2nd, 1980, in the North Sea and continues on September the 15th in Greece. The Villa Silvia near the Corfu Hilton doubles for the Spanish home of the assassin, Gonzalez. Among the extras is a model named Tula. She was one of quite a number of very beautiful girls. And three months after the film finished, it was revealed in the press that Tula was a man, or had been a man. <laughs> uh, the fact that um, she may have been turned out to be a chap was by and by, really, because she was so gorgeous. She was probably the most gorgeous of all the girls there, and a uh, very nice person as well. In this early scene, the filmmakers set the tone for the action. The Lotus car had been underwater, had had missiles in it, it seemed to be a great um, arsenal for Bond. And to take that away from him at the very beginning, you know, was an idea that to say, OK, we're, we're starting off the picture by making Bond more reliant on his own wits. At that time in New York, everyone's car was being stolen. And apparently, when the film showed there, the audience just roared and clapped and applauded because they, they wished that that would happen to everyone who stole their car. Well, I hope you have a car. This way. The whole concept of um, James Bond running out and saying, where's your car? And there you see a little de Chavaux. It's just so sort of like anti-Bond. It was hilarious. To film Bond and Molina's escape, Peter Lamont's crew turns the sleepy Greek town of Paji into a Spanish village. And for the car stunts, John Glenn turns to Rémy Julien. But he's, he's a, almost a legend in car chase sequences. And, and... And his two sons are tremendous, tremendous drivers. Despite taking a more realistic approach to Bond, the filmmakers do not want to lose the important element of humour. Love a drive in the country, don't you? <laughs> that was a very funny scene, and I had a lot to do with the design and planning of that sequence. And I desperately wanted to use the hillsides where they gather the olives and use the local colour. And we just adapted what was there and, and wrote it in a very amusing way. It's, I mean, it's, it's like a mix between James Bond and Keystone Cops. We love to thrill people. And um, there's nothing better than after a thrill to get the laugh. On October the 6th, John Glenn prepares to shoot one of the largest hand-to-hand -hand fight scenes to ever appear in a Bond film. Bob Simmons and his crew of stuntmen rehearse every move. Bob Simmons, of course, you, you say James Bond, you have to say Bob Simmons because he was like another James Bond. Wonderful stuntman, probably the best stuntman we'd had at that time. I liked him very much and he was very skillful and a man you could talk intelligently with and uh, he still liked to do the odd stunt himself. Careful preparation helps tilt the odds against injury in a scene with over 30 stunt performers. It is all in a night's work on a Bond film. Of course, when filmmakers plan a major sequence, it isn't just the stunt performers who see action. Blank firing weapons introduce another element of risk, and despite safety precautions, accidents do happen. One of the blank bullets uh, proved to be not so blank and I got shrapnel very close to the eye, 
lots of blood comes down, and it wasn't makeup, and Kobe was on the set, and he grabbed me, he didn't wait for the director to say print, and he ran with me to the doctor. And Kobe was my father's age. It's no wonder that we all loved him so much. The next evening finds the crew in more elegant surroundings, the Ashelon Casino in Gasturi, Corfu, a palace built by Empress Elizabeth of Austria. For filmmakers, it provides the perfect atmosphere of elegance for a key scene in the film. And for James Bond, the tables offer a welcome high-stakes diversion. To play the part of Columbo's mistress, filmmakers cast an actress with a James Bond connection all her own. We chose Cassandra Harris, who, as everyone probably knows, was um, Pierce Brosnan's wife. In fact, on the set in Corfu, Pierce arrived one weekend. The very handsome figure he cut too, you know. And uh... everyone, when they saw Pierce, thought he was just great and would make a great Bond. That's when I first met Pierce, and. Um... He met Cubby, of course. Cubby always put it in the back of his mind to sort of keep there. On October the 15th, the crew moves to the cliffs above Corfu's old Turkish fort. The sequence calls for Bond to kill a man in cold blood. Roger Moore has his doubts. In fact, I thought it was, although it's Bond, I thought it was a bit un-Roger Moore Bond to be that vicious, to kick a car over with somebody in. Well, we, we had a discussion about it, and I think there was a question about whether we just toss the pin in as if that's enough to unbalance it. I thought it didn't give enough sort of energy. As Derek Meddings and Peter Lamont prepare the Mercedes, tension on the set builds. All the key creative team agree this one moment will define James Bond for years to come. Roger and I had a, quite a discussion about this. Roger had a, a reputation anyway. He'd done all those series on The Saints, and he'd done all these James Bond films before, and so he'd more or less set his character. So you couldn't depart too much for it. All you could do is show a harder edge to his character, and that's what I tried to achieve. And I think that helped, helped the film. I think this gave him the strength of character, which I was looking for. The next day, the cast and crew move across Greece to face a different kind of challenge. At the edge of the Pindus Mountains, atop 24 mammoth rock spires, sits the holy community of Meteora. It's incredible landscape. Years ago, the, the monks built monasteries on some of these rocks. They have to carry everything up by road basket. There are no roads up. We thought we'd done a deal with the local bishop to allow us to use an adjacent rock. When we arrived, of course, uh, the money that was paid over hadn't reached the local monks, so they refused to cooperate. In fact, they went out of their way to sabotage our filming. There are two monks there who don't want us to film. I have no idea why. This caused great consternation among the local inhabitants who lived in the cities, and they were prepared to uh, actually go up and uh, attack the monasteries and throw the monks out. We managed to uh, overcome the problem by building our own monastery on an adjoining rock where they had never built before. The case actually went up to the Greek Supreme Court, and they convened a special uh, body of judges, and they had to decide who actually controlled the right to use the land. Was it the monasteries, or was it the local government? And uh, it came out in favor of the local government, so they, they actually had to decide the issue after <laughs> all that time. To add verisimilitude to the Cold War climax of the story, filmmakers have a Polish MI2 helicopter flown in. Shooting the final confrontation comes nearly four months before the end of principal photography. And action! No, Molina, is not the answer. We'll turn him over to the Greek police. Out of my way, James. Each of the cast must find a way to catalogue this performance so that it meshes seamlessly with scenes to be shot weeks later at Pinewood Studios. Other challenges for the actors are not so cerebral. Roger's not too good on heights. And I had to do a sort of rock climbing and scaling edges of precipices. I've got to climb the other side, right? Yes. I've got right to go around the other side. No, no, you've got to climb that right-hand side. Yeah. See the edge yeah. of the scene now. Yeah. Yeah. That's the place. 
It's always like, you want me to stand there? Well, looking down there, you've got to be joking. <laughs> Are you talking sex, you two, because you're being recorded? Despite joking on the set, Moore's nerves get the best of him. I took a lot of Valium and drank some warm beer to do that in the morning, I tell you. For director Glenn, the climbing sequence gives him a chance to create a signature moment. Hitchcock always used to make an appearance in his movies, and I suppose I had a similar idea when I, I always used to put my little trademark on all my films. I'd, I'd always use a pigeon coming out of an unexpected hole when Roger Moore's climbing in the Meteoris when he's like 400 feet off the ground. He puts his hand into a handhold and a pigeon flies out and nearly knocks him off the rock. Um, I guess you could say that pigeon is my trademark. We used a chap called Rick Sylvester for the double for some of the climbing on that. He did the ski parachute jump in Sp Spy Who Loved Me, and we used him again here to do a similar trick. We had a sequence where Bond has to climb climb up the the rock face. He he gets kicked off and falls down and, and finishes up hanging on a, on a rope. That was quite a hairy hour stunt. It was all, everything was done for real. Even if you're on a rope, if you fall far enough, the, the jerk you get can be very uh, injurious. I immediately went to special effects de department. I said, I threw myself on their mercy. You got to save my life. I told them I'm going to do this scene, and I know how to do this. Derek Meddings, who was the special effects supervisor, built a trough to arrest his fall. When I got to the end of the rope, we'd move these sandbags in this box. That would these these heavy sandbags that would uh, dampen the sudden deceleration, which is what could kill or injure you. When I saw Derek. Meddings rig. I, I was a bit nervous because it was only it was a real Heath Robinson affair. It was uh, there was a man risking his life on the end of that rope. The, the day we got there to the location, there was a funeral procession in the village, and and then the, the, the box that the sandbags were in, it, it kind of resembled a casket. And also from the location site, we had a perfect view of the of the village cemetery. So you didn't have to be an English major, you know, for the symbolism not to be lost in you. I was worried about this. Letting go for a climber is, in a way, goes against the grain because everything we work and train for is not to let go. On a chilly October afternoon, Rick Sylvester lets go. <laughs> I get to end the rope. The rope didn't break because I was still about 350 feet off the ground, and I was really happy, and I forgot I'm supposed to be stunned. I'm alive, I'm alive, it worked. And then I said, oh, that's right, I'm supposed to be unconscious. Then I kind of sagged. But luckily, this doesn't show. He did a great job of the fall off. He was very, very good. But he, unfortunately, he was quite a small man, and, and he was very difficult to make him look like, um, like Bond. He's a big guy. He's around 6'5", and I'm more like 5'6". And so, you know, with the $700 wig and the cameras far enough away, you could almost think, of, really, that I was Bond. Back in England, John Glenn starts work on the film's pre-title sequence. I got the idea many years ago when I was walking, walking around Palmer Studios and uh, I saw one of our technicians on a Sunday. He, he brought his young son into work. The boy had a remote controlled car and that gave me the spark to think about this remote controlled helicopter. Mark Wolf was the pilot, who was a superb helicopter pilot. It all took place around the chimneys and the industrial architecture of Beckton Gasworks, which was very spectacular. It was incredible excitement. You know, when you hang underneath a helicopter and there's n the noise and the blades swirling round and the helicopter is doing all sorts of various maneuvers and you're hanging underneath and you're enjoying it, you know, that was really incredible. Derek Menning's came up with a great scheme because we had to get the helicopter, fly into one of these big halls, fly in and fly out. And it was quite a hairy old stunt. And we were looking around this place for some for a building where we could actually fly a helicopter into this building for this particular sequence. And of course there wasn't one, but there was this enormous building which had it had an entrance would have been ideal. So I thought if we did a foreground miniature to match this building, and put the entrance in the miniature, we could use the real helicopter, line it up and fly it, and that's what we did. And we had to build quite a major rig uh, with a full-size helicopter on the end with rotors going round, which we, uh, we mounted on a track going up the inside of the building. We actually put Roger Moore inside this helicopter with the, the rotors going, and we shot all the, all the exciting scenes inside the hangar where he's trying to find his way out of the building. I 
I thought real stars with Mark Wolf, the pilot, and particularly where he tips him, tips him down the chimney pot, you know. While famed underwater director Al Giddings stages elaborate action in the Bahamas, John Glenn and his crew also face water problems in London. Well, first of all, Carol Bouquet wasn't happy underwater. Somewhere along the line, they discovered that she couldn't dive because she had sinus trouble. The problem was, how were we going to get her to look as if she was underwater with Bond? It sort of fell to me to come up with a way of doing it. They shot it in slow motion with wind machine and put on some masks, and we put the bubbles in, and uh, Derek made them fit, and it worked like a dream. I think it fooled many people, actually. After celebrating New Year's in London, the crew moves to the jagged peaks of the Dolomites in the Italian Alps. To play the young, but not so innocent, skating protege Bibi Dahl, the filmmakers cast real-life skating star Lynn Holly Johnson. This is such a sweet girl, but absolutely worried the life out of me because I thought I was getting a bit long in the tooth even then to be seen on the screen with a girl who was under 20. Oh, Roger, he is, he is just, he's just a madman. He is a nut. I don't think there's anybody in the world who loves his job more than Roger. I mean, he, he had 007 down. Moore not only has to appear on screen with Lynn Holly, he has to ski next to a vivacious champion athlete. To do close-ups of me, uh, they had me sort of locked in on the back of a sled. There's a wonderful character in a long coat sort of in front of the sled going down on skis, so controlling the weight of the sled. It's hard to balance on a sled. <laughs> For the more strenuous work on the slopes, John Glenn turns to German ski champion and filmmaker Willy Bogner. Bogner helped create snow sequences for On Her Majesty's Secret Service and The Spy Who Loved Me. I had already done two bonds before and for, uh, for Your Eyes Only. The, the big challenge was to, obviously to top the sequences and, and I, I had the opportunity also to write the, the sequences by that time. He and I, between us, uh, and Michael as well, devised this, this scene which you see in the film. Willie is this little man with the energy of 50 men. Uh, and, and he just has a vision of what he's going to shoot, and it doesn't matter how many times it takes to get that, he's going he's to get that shot, and he's going to have those explosions go off perfectly, and the skier just missing it perfectly. He had a pair of skis that were, that had, you know, skis go up on the front. His went up on the front and the back. So he could ski forward and backwards. He used to have a camera that went between his legs. It was amazing to see him at work. Our biggest problem there was that it snowed over Christmas just before we got there. And then we virtually had no snow for the next six weeks. But it was, in fact, ideal for our film because we were using motorcycles with spikes and we didn't want deep snow. We wanted just a covering of snow. It worked out really beautifully because Remy Julien, you know, the great stunt driver, he did a fantastic job with the motorbikes. Uh, it took a few broken arms and casts and things. <laughs> Skiers and motorcycle drivers don't just have to worry about snow, but also pure ice. And I thought, you know, if you had a bob and then bond on skis and then two motorbikes in the back, that would be really something else. He approached me and he said, oh, I'd love to, to ski down the bob run following the bobs along, you see. So I said, well, the only problem is the bobs will go faster than you are because they're heavier. So we have to devise a way, to, you know, to keep you at a certain distance. I said to him, I suppose you wouldn't consider being tied on to the bob, would you? And he said, well, that's a good idea. <laughs> Throughout the early winter months of 1981, Willy Bogner and his team of skiers break all boundaries. Filmmakers John Glenn, Michael Wilson, and Cubby Broccoli. The risk is just as real. At stake, the fate of the world's most popular fictional character.
when for your eyes only premieres on Wednesday, June the 24th, 1981 at London's Leicester Square Odeon Theatre, critics and fans alike hail the return of the classic James Bond. The film is an instant smash and sets the course for 007 throughout the 80s.